everybody welcome back to my channel i appreciate you coming back and taking another look at one of my videos i recently got a new camera so you'll see that the setup looks a little different you see this the camera angle is just wider it's a much better camera and i kind of love it because it's a huge step up from where i was at so yay i'm really excited to talk about this gangster tonight because he's literally the god of the mafia he invented it so without further ado Salvatore Little Caesar Maranzano was born on July 31st, 1886 in Castella Mare del Golfo in Sicily, Italy. His parents, Domenico Maranzano and Antonia Pescota, had 12 children, but unfortunately only six of them lived to see adulthood. I cannot for the life of me find what his mother and father did for a living. I don't know why it just does not exist on the internet. Maranzano actually spent his childhood dreaming of becoming a priest, and he studied to become one. The education was extensive, and it gave him the ability to hold extremely intelligent conversations and maneuver easily through the underground. When he was still young, he threw away the dream of being a priest, and he got involved in the mafia. Instead of studying to be a priest, he set his sights on studying the Roman Empire. He was obsessed with Julius Caesar and the Roman Empire as a whole, and anybody who would listen, he would talk their ear off about these subjects. And that's how he got his nickname, Little Caesar. In Castella Mare, Maranzano rose through the ranks under Don Vito Ferro. Don Vito Ferro was a capo de tu capi in their family structure, and that just means that he was the boss of bosses in the Italian mafia. Don Vito Ferro wanted to start taking control of the American mafia as well, because he had lived in America for two and a half years in 1901 while he was on the lam. But while he was in the United States, he was arrested in connection to a counterfeiting operation in Hackensack, New Jersey, and he was suspected of being involved with a string of murders called the Barrel Murders because they put the bodies in barrels. So he couldn't come back to the United States to take control of the American Mafia. So Pharaoh sent his most trusted subordinate, Salvatore Maranzano, to the United States to seize control of the American Mafia for him. His plan was to run the American Mafia from his base in Castella Mare. Maranzano emigrated from Italy to the United States to seize control of the current Capo de Tutti Capi, Joe Massaria. Now, Joe Massaria never took that position's name, but that's how he was treated in the family at the time. Maranzano's plan was just to build his empire and make his empire bigger than Massaria's and take over the mafia. He also had a legitimate career as a real estate agent and that was operating pretty successfully. And that's how he washed his money that he earned through organized crime. He would just put it through the real estate company. But he had just started and Masseria had been in America his whole life. So he had a big advantage on him because he had a lot of time to build a trusted family, a trusted crew, and everybody he needed on his side. Shortly after Maranzano arrived in America, Don Vito Ferro was imprisoned in Sicily. Instead of abandoning the plan or returning to Italy when Ferro was arrested, Maranzano decided to just enact his plan in America himself. Don Vito Ferro died on September 20th, 1943, after he was arrested on June 27th, 1930. He never operated as a boss from within prison, so the day that he got arrested, he was taken out of the picture. So at the time, Maranzano and Masseria are going on parallel paths. They're both the bosses of their own families, and they're just kind of staying out of each other's way. Maranzano is building up his family while Masseria is just making sure that everybody stays loyal to him. It became obvious to everybody that this was going to be a war sooner or later, and it was probably going to be sooner. Both Maranzano and Masseria, even though they were bitter enemies and they hated each other, they were known as Mustache Peets. Typically, they had pretty long mustaches, hence the name, and they went down the side of their mouths. Think of the rendition of the old-time gangster thinking, twirling his mustache. Yeah, that's that's these that's these guys. Mustache Pete's were old world gangsters. They followed the rules of the Sicilian mafia, and they assumed that anybody that wasn't Italian could not be trusted, and they adhered to the strict guidelines of the Sicilian mafia, and that included things like they weren't allowed to deal drugs. There was a lot that went into the Sicilian mafia's rules. The younger generation of gangsters that were coming up, such as Luciano, Genovese, Castello, they didn't believe in these traditions at all. They enjoyed the benefits 
that came from working with Jewish and Irish gangsters to make a profit, the younger generation of gangsters started to team up. These were the men that were Italian by heritage, but they were raised in America. Even if they weren't born in America, they came over to America when they were young. So they were fully raised in America. And they had a very big appreciation for working with people of other ethnicities. These guys were only motivated by profit. They saw no benefit in annexing the other gangs of New York just because they didn't hail from the same part of the world as their forefathers. It made it a lot worse that the other gangs in New York were making a lot more money than the Mafia because the Mafia wouldn't deal with anybody that wasn't purely Italian. So the other gangs that were working with people outside of their ethnicity were making much more money. This new team of gangsters led by Luciano would come to be known as the Young Turks. It's still a rule to this day that a made member of the Mafia has to be full-blooded Italian, but the Peets wanted all of the wheeling and dealing and killing and chilling done with the Italians and the Italians alone. They had absolutely no interest in drug trafficking, which was a pretty big problem because it was an up-and-coming boom of income for the Mafia, and the older generation fought this income off for as long as they possibly could. The Young Turks viewed the Mustache Peets as a barrier to Americanizing and modernizing the Mafia and its incomes. Their interest in dealing with only Italians even stretched to the public. The way that we see the Mafia doing illicit gambling, taking fees for protection, all the stuff that the Mafia makes money on, they even wanted those dealings to be purely Italian. They came over in the same wave of Italian immigrants as the legitimate Italians did. And that led to a lot of Italians being marginalized, and the public at large was immensely biased against all Italians because of the mustache peats. You could go to stores and see signs in the windows that say, no Italians allowed, because everybody feared the Italians because of the mustache peats. The mustache peats' unwillingness to deal with anybody that was non-Italian led to an extremely restricted territory. They only operated in Italian neighborhoods, and they only dealt with Italians, whether they were dealing with mafia or not. In other words, if they went to the store to buy bread, they were only buying that bread from an Italian. They held extremely high positions in society. They ran companies and they controlled industries. They also operated prostitution rings and gambling halls. One thing that they became well known for was the black hand extortion racket. They were absolute domestic terrorists to anybody that was Italian. The black hand extortion racket was when they would send a note to anybody that was Italian born and had immigrated to America with a black hand print on it. The note threatened the recipient that if they didn't pay them, they would die or be physically harmed. And these are the guys that aren't mafia. They're the ones that are just operating stores. They they have legitimate forms of income. So they got these notes to pay the mustache peats. Whenever somebody ignored the notice, a family member of theirs was killed, and that usually led them to paying. This scheme took place all across America. This wasn't limited to New York. Of course, it happened in New York, but it also happened in Chicago, in New Orleans, in St. Louis, in Kansas City. Anywhere that there was any kind of Italian heritage present, this racket was going on. One of Masaria's lieutenants, Gaetano Reina, left Masaria's operation and he went to work for Maranzano. And that really pissed off Masaria. So for the crime of leaving Masaria's family, Masaria sent Luciano to have Reina killed for the crime that he committed of switching sides. Reina was killed on February 26, 1930. This murder was the match that ignited the flame of the Casella Marisi War. The war raged from February of 1930 when Gaetano was killed, and it lasted all the way until April of 1931 in New York. The big hitters on Masaria's side include Lucky Luciano, Albert Mad Hatter, Anastasia, Vito Genovese, Alfred Minio, Willie Moretti, Joe Adonis, and Frank Costello. So they are facing off against Maranzano's side, and Maranzano has Joseph Joey Bananas Bonanno, Stefano the Undertaker Magadino, Joe Perfacci and Joe Aiello. Now, this is just the big names in each of the families that I'm going over. This doesn't include the hundreds of soldiers that the Mafia had. And those were the guys that were on the streets. They were doing the crime. They were running the gambling rackets. They were doing all the work. And the way that these upper echelon guys got their money was when the soldiers would go out, commit the crimes, and they would kick it up to the upper guys from all of their illegal activities. Now, the Castello Marisi War starts, and to outsiders looking in, it's a war between Masseria and Maranzano for control of the American Mafia. But internally, there's a whole other layer to this war. There's a war going on between generations 
generations. This is where we start to see the emergence of the Mustache Peets and the Young Turks. Their ideas are completely opposite, and the Young Turks had a much bigger group because they had been recruiting new soldiers to prepare for the war. All of those new soldiers are young, so they share the ideas with the younger guys. And they also have bigger numbers because they deal with people that aren't just Italian, so obviously their associates are going to be much bigger than the Mustache Peets who only deal with Italians. Their forward-thinking ideas about increasing the profit of the mafia, it, it kind of turned tough guys into cult followers. Everybody loved what they heard when Luciano and all of them started explaining what they wanted to do, how they wanted to revolutionize the mafia. Everybody loved it because it, obviously it meant more money. So they were on their side. This is a group of the new generation and they're from both sides, the Maranzano side and the Masaria side. So it doesn't matter what side they're on in this war. They group together to form the Young Turks. The Castello Marisi War was going on from August of 1930 to February of 1931. The Young Turks wanted nothing more than to end this war. The violence, the death, the toll it took on everybody, the drop in profits from constantly hiding out from enemies. The Turks found this needless and stupid and immature. This was during the time of Prohibition. They should be out bootlegging. They should be out at underground taverns drinking with everybody and having a good time, but instead they're jumping from apartment to apartment and mattress hopping just to not get killed because they're in the middle of this war. Now, even though Masaria had the advantage of having the better equipped family, out of the two, between him and Maranzano, he was the least forward-thinking boss. Maranzano is definitely a mustache Pete, but his ideas about forming families within territories and his willingness to work with people outside of the Italian heritage, it attracted the Turks to go to Maranzano's side, even though they were currently on Masaria's side. So Masaria was losing people because he was so stuck in the old ways. Luciano is Masaria's right-hand man. The young Turks are seeing absolutely Absolutely no end in sight for this war. And even though it didn't last that long, a year and a half is a really long time when you're constantly on the run. They wanted this war over yesterday. They hated it. As Masseria was losing guys from his antiquated ideals, and they were going over to Maranzano's side, it started to become pretty obvious that Maranzano was going to win this war. Reina, do you remember the guy that kicked off the war? Yeah, he belonged to the Reina family, and that was essentially what we call today the Lucchese family. They were super, super powerful and because Masaria killed Gaetano Reina, the Reina family threw all of their support behind Maranzano. Masaria's family had Joe Iola killed in the Times Square office that he ran and Maranzano answered that murder with the murder of Steve Ferrigno and Manfredi Minio and these were two really high ranking guys within Masaria's faction. Frank Scalise took control of what used to belong to Minio and he jumped ship and went on to Maranzano's side and then Joseph Catan which was one of Masaria's most important lieutenants. He was killed two days later. Luciano reached out to Maranzano to talk because he wanted to end the war. He sat down with Maranzano and Maranzano laid out his plans, what he wanted to do with the mafia. He laid out how he wanted to have the five families. He wanted to have a boss of each of the families. He wanted to have the position of Capu di Tutti Capi, which was just the boss of all bosses. So the boss of each of the five families would report to him. And Maranzano Maranzano's idea was to take the outlaws that were currently only operating illegally and turn them into legitimate businessmen. And the Young Turks loved the sound of that. It was music to their ears. Maranzano and Luciano made an agreement. Luciano said that he would arrange to have Masseria killed if Maranzano would immediately end the Castello Marisi War and if he would put Luciano into a position of power and, and let him help create this new mafia that Maranzano was talking about. At the end of the day, the thing that was most important to Luciano and all of the Young Turks was just to see this war come to an end, and they got it. On April 15th, 1931, Luciano went to Nueva Villa Tomorrow. That was a restaurant in Coney Island. He went there for a card game with Masaria. He got up and excused himself and went to the bathroom. And while he was in the bathroom, Anastasia, Genovese, Joe Adonis, and Bugsy Siegel, they came in and killed Masaria. His infamous crime scene photos show him laying dead with the ace of spades still held in his right hand, and he had bullets in his 
head and his back and in his chest. So they lit this man up. Maranzano immediately got to work implementing his ideas. He put the five families in place immediately. And each of these five families had a clear hierarchy of a boss and underboss. At the time, there was no consigliere. That position was an idea that was came up with later. They had the capos and they had the soldiers and then they had the associates that they dealt with. The associates could be anybody with any ethnic background, but in order to move up through the ranks of the mafia, you had to be a made man, and to be a made man, you have to be full-blown Italian. He established the bosses of the five families, and that was Luciano, Joe Profacci, Vincent Mangano, Thomas Gagliano, and obviously himself. And he made it so that any mafia families that were operating outside of New York City were going to be organized by one crime family per city. And he immediately established himself as the Capo di Tutti Capi, and that just meant that all the bosses of the family were going to report to him. He established a code of conduct, and he also took the name from the Italian mafia and brought it to the American mafia and named it La Cosa Nostra, which in English is our thing. It was written that La Cosa Nostra comes before anything else, your friends, your family, absolutely anything in the world, La Cosa Nostra comes first. There were clear consequences for breaking the rules. Some of these rules included talking about the family or sleeping with another maid member's wife, and those were immediate death sentences. The death sentence could also be handed down just for discussing La Cosa Nostra with their wives. This was a secret society, and it was going to remain that way. None of the main members were ever allowed to raise their hands to another maid member. The war was forgotten, and all tensions from the war or before were gone. This was the mafia's chance to reform and start from scratch. There would be hearings to straighten out any issues between made guys, but this is new issues. If it was an issue from before, it's gone. Maranzano made it clear that no old grudges would be carried into this new mafia. He's even quoted as saying, if your own brother was killed, don't try to find who did it to get even. He said if you did, you would pay with your life. Now, this is a cause for celebration. The war was over, the family was structured completely different. Profits were going to skyrocket because they were now allowed to deal with people outside of only Italians, and the future was looking bright for the Mafia. Tensions were thrown to the wind, and everybody was getting along. Even Al Capone sent $6,000, but he didn't attend. By the end of the night, according to Valachi, the table was stacked with money that the guests had contributed as they walked in the door. Valachi said that he never saw such a pile of money in his life. Maranzano set up shop in an office in the Grand Central building, on 46th and Park Avenue. This is the official location for his real estate company, and all business dealings, both legitimate and illicit, are out of this office. His employees were ranking members within his family, and they regularly came to the office fully armed. Maranzano was known in the underground as Little Caesar. The reason for that is because he was super fascinated with Julius Caesar and the way that the Roman Empire worked. He was raised in Sicily, and he was involved in gambling and bootleg and prostitution and a whole bunch of other vices. Even though he only came to America because Don Vito Ferro sent him to take control of the American Mafia for him, he had no hand whatsoever in the organization that Maranzano put in place. When Ferro went to prison, Maranzano didn't skip a beat, and he still put his ideas in place, and it was his plan all along. Don Vito Ferro just sent him. The Roman Empire closely resembles the structure of Maranzano's American Mafia. When Maranzano took over the family, he dubbed himself the Capo day to t copy or boss of all bosses. So if we look at the hierarchy of the Roman Empire with this in mind, the Kabu day to t copy is going to be the emperor. They're equal to each other because the emperor is the absolute ruler, the final decision maker, and that is the same case with the Kabu day to t copy. Below the emperor is the patricians and the senators. The patricians were wealthy landowners and they were descendants of the founding fathers. They were the ruling class. So if you look at that in the form of the mafia, this is where we're going to find the bosses of the families, the underbosses of the families. So these are the really important guys, and they're the ones that are making laws within the families. Right below that is the equestrians. This is the cavalry, and they became wealthy businessmen just by taking on the role of becoming an equestrian. In the mafia, this would be the same as the capos. Below that is the plebeians. 
and the plebeians and the soldiers and the mafia can be mixed together and they weren't wealthy some of them were poor but it's what makes up the country and that's the same thing with the mafia while there is a few high-ranking guys the actual mafia is the soldiers that are on the streets this group is the one that's running the rackets they're doing the gambling they're doing the loans and the only reason that the top guys are rich is because of these soldiers kicking up part of their earnings to the top guys. While each individual soldier rarely has a lot of power, the soldiers as a collective is a very powerful group, and the bosses always want to keep this group on their side. Because if the soldiers are against you, you don't have a chance of running the country or the families. The Roman Empire was comprised of families. These individual families would control territories and they would rule the certain areas. And that's what Maranzano put in place to have individual families with individual territories. The original families were the Maranzano family for Salvatore Maranzano himself, and that's known now as the Bonanno family. We got the Profaci family named after Joe Profaci, and that's known now as the Colombo family. We got the Mangano family, they're named after Vincent Mangano, and they are known now as the Gan Bambino family. We got the Luciano family. This is named obviously after Lucky Luciano. And now today they're known as the Genovese family. And then we got the Gagliano family who is named after Tommy Gagliano. And they're now known as the Lucchese family. There's a reason that we call the families what we call them nowadays. Even though there's been multiple bosses throughout the years and the family names are supposed to change with the bosses. And the guys that are currently named the individual families, they're long gone. They're dead. But they took on these permanent names because of Valachi. Joseph Valachi was a member of the Mafia and he became a government informant. He was the first person ever to publicly confirm the existence of the five families in New York City. The guys that were the bosses of the families at the time of Valachi's testimony was Gambino, Bonanno, Lucchese, etc. So those are the guys that we now call it the Lucchese family. We now call it the Gambino family. And that's just because that's who was ruling the family when Valachi testified. And that's pretty crazy because that means means that the monikers that these five families have been known by the public for for almost 60 years was given to them by a rat. Now remember, Maranzano had told his people to start coming to work unarmed because he thought that there was a police raid coming. While the police raid never came, Maranzano did tell his people that soon they were going to have to start hitting the mattresses again. And that just means that a war was brewing and there was going to be another war. Hitting the mattresses just means that you got to jump from apartment to apartment and you sleep on mattresses in other people's houses. So Maranzano saw this war coming and he decided to take matters into his own hands. He felt Luciano starting to hate him. Let's be real here. If Luciano doesn't like you, you die. He decided that the only way to stop another war was to get rid of Luciano. But in order to get rid of Luciano, you had to get rid of a big chunk of guys. After he killed Luciano, he was going to have to kill Genovese, Al Capone, Frank Costello, Joe Adonis, Dutch Schultz, Willie Moretti, pretty much everybody that was loyal to Luciano had to go. So the plan was in motion to get rid of all of these guys. He hired Vincent Cole, an Irish hitman, to kill Luciano. He paid him $25,000 in advance of the hit, and he was going to pay him another $25,000 once the job was done. The guy that Maranzano hired, Cole, he was known as the Mad Dog. And this wasn't a term of endearment. It was more like a dog that has rabies. Somebody tipped Luciano off that a hit was coming for him. Maranzano invited Luciano to his office to have a conversation. And obviously Luciano knows that this is where the hit is going to take place. And he was right. Maranzano planned to have him come into the office. And shortly after he came in, Paul was going to come in and kill Luciano. So since Luciano knew this was coming, obviously he prepared. He had members of Murder, Inc., Jewish guys, because we know that the Jewish mafia killed the Italian mafia and vice versa. And the reason for that is so that you can't be connected with any hit because they don't recognize people of the opposite gang. So Luciano directs these Jewish members of Murder, Inc. to dress as cops and go to Maranzano's office. The plan was for them to go to Maranzano's office, pretend to raid the office, and kill Maranzano. The only guy from the Italian mafia that joined this hit was Tommy Lucchese. I'm not really sure why Tommy joined the hit, but he did. The group stabbed and shot Maranzano to death. As they were fleeing the scene, they passed Carl, and Carl turned around and ran the other way because he thought that they were real cops. Maranzano's murder kicked off what we call today the Night of the Sicilian Vest. 
Vespers. This night was planned, and the whole point was to annihilate the entire generation of Mustache Pete's. Any guys that were still steeped in the Italian heritage that clung to the old ways of the Sicilian Mafia, any guys that were against change, they were killed. Maranzano was killed on September 10th, 1931. On that day, according to the U.S. Attorney General at the time, 40 members of La Cosa Nostra died by gunfire. Jimmy Marino was gunned down as he stood in the doorway of a Bronx barbershop. Louis Russo and Sam Monaco were reported missing on this day. Three days later, their bodies washed ashore Newark Bay. Their throats were slit and their skulls were caved in. Authorities said they showed sign of torture, so I'm guessing this all happened while they were alive. Falachi said that Sam had an iron pipe hammered up his you-know-where. On the 13th, Joseph Saragusa, who was the leader of the Pittsburgh crime family, was shot to death in his house. On the 17th, Meyer Shapiro, who controlled bootlegging and gambling and prostitution in the east side of New York, he was killed by Abe Kid Twist Rells and Martin Bugsy Goldstein. A year later, his brother, Willie Shapiro, was killed by the same people, and he was killed by being buried alive, which unlocked a whole fear of mine. That was my fear growing up, being buried alive. That's the worst death in the world. Worst fear ever. I don't like even thinking about it. On October 15th, Joe Artizone, who was the head of the Los Angeles crime family, disappeared, and he was presumed murdered, but they never found his body. So pretty much the Young Turk stepped up and they killed any top-ranking mafia guys that could even possibly be mistaken as a mustache Pete. Luciano made it clear that he didn't agree with the mass murders. He was actually really against it and that's why he went to such drastic measures of killing his boss in order to end the Castella Marisi war. He justified the night of the Sicilian Vespers by saying that this was it. This was the last purge and once they got rid of all of the mustache Pete's, everything would even out and peace would ascend on their world. After all the leaders were taken down, Luciano scrapped the position of Capu de Tutti Capi altogether. He instead put together the commission, which was a group of the bosses of each of the five families. He believed that if he took the position of Capu de Tutti Capi, it was going to incite other people to kill him in a fight to take the position for themselves. People would constantly want the position. It was just a bad look. Plus, the commission was a committee and it gave every family an equal say in anything that happened. Later on, Genovese would go to Luciano and beg him to put the position of Capu de Tutti Capi back in place and let him run it and just be the acting guy. Because Luciano was currently annexed to Italy. At the moment, he was in Havana, Cuba, but he lived in Italy, so obviously there would have to be an acting boss, and Genovese wanted that to be him. And he was annoying. He was just in his ear begging all the time. Bah, 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 bah. So Luciano got annoyed and fed up, and he pretty much told him, like, listen, if I wanted that position to exist, I would take it and I would run shit. I don't want the position. Stop asking me. Shut the F up. And I love that because he put Genovese in his place and Genovese gave it up. Nobody on earth has ever substantiated a photo of a living Maranzano. The only picture that exists of him is the low resolution crime scene photos of his dead body. And it had been mutilated beyond recognition. He was covered in blood. He looked nothing like himself. There's been multiple photos that have gone around in the past that people believed were Maranzano, but were wrong. Previously, there was a photo that was in a book written by J. Robert Nash in 1990, and it was reprinted in the Encyclopedia of Organized Crime in 1992, and that's the photo that was associated with Maranzano. This was the photo that everybody used, and this went on for 20 years. In 2009, David Critchley proved that that photo wasn't Maranzano. It was Salvatore Messina, Joe Messina's brother. In 1931, when Maranzano was killed, there was a sketch done by the coroner of his body after the murder, and even this sketch seemed to have more details of his face than the actual photo did. In 2019, Canadian researcher Peter Kahn had bought an old Italian magazine on eBay. He was going through it and he stumbled on a picture of Maranzano. The magazine claimed that it was the mugshot of Maranzano from Piccola, an old, old, old time Italian magazine. Kahn sent the photo to The Informer. The Informer is a great magazine that talks about everything organized crime related. They usually only only put out an annual issue, so only one magazine a year goes out by them. They didn't have an issue scheduled for 2019, but when they got the picture of Maranzano, it was such a big deal that they put together an entire 
issue and put this special issue out just to show everybody the photo of Maranzano. But even that, soon after, it was debunked and we found out that it was a German serial killer named Peter Curtin. Joe Bonanno wrote an autobiography. It was called A Man of Honor. In the autobiography, he says that Maranzano was robust, about five feet, nine inches tall, full-bodied with no excess flaccid flesh on, deep-chested with sturdy muscular arms and legs. Maranzano was handsome. And even Bonanno didn't have a photo of him, and the only photo that he had was the crime scene photo, and that's the only photo of Maranzano in his autobiography. In 2009, after the photo was revealed, to be Messina. The informer took the coroner's sketch and rendered a photo of what he probably looked like, and that's the closest we've ever gotten to seeing what Maranzano probably looked like. So typically at this time I do a how this guy has impacted our current day and age, and I mention movies that they're portrayed in, and if they had one thing that was particular to them I would mention it here, but I'm not gonna do that with Maranzano. If you want to see how Maranzano affected the world, just look at today's American Mafia. He invented it, they still run on the same structure that Maranzano built all of those years ago. So it's very clear what effect Maranzano has on today's day and age. And that is all. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you come back and take another look at my other videos. Go ahead and hit that like, follow, subscribe, all the buttons to be notified whenever one of my new videos comes out. And I hope you have a great week. Thanks so much. Bye.